the key aspects of um, the cancer center as I see them. And um, about training as it goes for 2022, training has changed over the year, the purpose of training um, has changed over time. Uh, when I did my training, the goals were quite different than training in 2022. And that's one a very important aspect that we are proud to present as an opportunity for you to consider. But before I go there, um, we are a small uh, cancer center, relatively small. We have about 40 PIs uh, that are dedicated for mentoring, um, proud to mentor and get the next generation scientists out of the laboratory. Um, we have amazing series of core facilities that help perform science to the highest caliber, and you're going to hear more about it. And one standing um, among them is our uh, discovery, drug discovery, or we call it the Prebis Center, which uh, is a group of about 50 or more scientists that are dedicated to discover the next uh, drugs and next, next medicines. And you as trainee will have the opportunity to work with them and uh, learn how to take basic research finding and translate it to reach possible clinical evaluation. Things that have been happening here more and more in recent years. We do outstanding science a, is a, a decent proportion, over 20% of our publication reach um, highest impact journals. And um, much of the research that we perform is translational in, in essence. That would mean that um, we study unmet clinical needs that we identify in patients and we learn how to um, solve them um, and use those solutions as either the next marker or next target or next drug that we are able to develop in-house or in collaboration with other scientists. But I would like to um, pay a couple of minutes attention as per what is special about us and what is special about uh, performing research or being trained in research in 2022? I think that um, what's special about doing research and being trained nowadays is the ability to uh, gain fundamental understanding of um, critical problems. And that is coming out in high caliber research, um, cancer research that we perform here. Um, we have the ability to translate in uh, collaboration with experts that we have on campus that I related to, um, basic finding into some clinical opportunities, a clinical evaluation, something that uh, you are not likely to find in most other places. And um, you will be able, and that's as important as anything else, to do anything that you can think of once you finish training in our cancer center. And that speaks for the level of training and the um, uh, rigor that is going to be part of the training that will get you anywhere you want afterwards. So uh, we have a PEC program. You're going to learn about our uh, training in much more detail. You're going to learn about our facilities. You're going to learn about training programs and uh, you're going to learn from uh, folks that are being trained these days as per how things go. And at this point, I will pass um, uh, the presentation to uh, Max D'Angelo, who has been a key leader in uh, the training architecture here at the Cancer Center. Max, it's all yours. Yeah, thank you, Seb. Uh, yeah, so let me share my slide. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Seb, uh, for the introduction. So my name is Max D'Angelo, and I'm the Associate Director of Education and Training at the San Forman and Provis Cancer Center. And as uh, Seb said, the, the main goal of, of this event is to show you the opportunities that our institute offer for postdoctoral training and to show you how exciting it is to do your postdoc at, at San Forman and Provis. Now, before I tell you a little bit about some of the reasons why you should consider training with us, uh, we briefly want to go through the agenda in case you don't have it in hand to know, to know what to expect. So after uh, my introduction now, you will hear about opportunities for, for uh, education and professional development from our Office of Education and Training. Uh, we'll also hear about our initiatives for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
of, uh, through by our uh, co-chair of DEI uh, of the DEI committee, and you will also learn our about our state-of-the-art research facilities that allow us really to do amazing science here at, at Sanford Bernard. We will then move to tell you about our T32 training program. So these are NIH sponsor. Uh, uh, programs to for postdoctoral fellowships in uh, immunology and in cancer um, drug discovery. So we will hear from the PIs of both programs that we have and also from the trainees. You will hear about the work and how, how our institute have contributed to the development of their projects and their professional development. Uh, we will have uh, some time for questions after that. And if you have questions throughout uh, the program, just write them on the chat and we'll get to them when we when we get to this to this moment. And at the end, you will have time to uh, meet with us in breakout rooms. So this is where you can meet the speakers, the trainees, you can meet with the directors of education, or, or, and we can also meet with the faculty at the Institute. And I really encourage you to, to go to these breakout rooms. Even if you haven't signed up in advance, just go. They will be open. You can move from one to the other one. So come meet us, because we really want to talk to you and, and tell you how exciting it is to, to work here. Now, why training at Sanford Bernard and Provis? So as uh, Dr. Ronai said, we are one of only seven basic research NCI designated cancer centers in the US, so one of seven. So we were designated an NCI cancer center in 1981. So this is our 40th anniversary. And we have been able to maintain this highly prestigious and extremely competitive, in fact, uh, recognition because we have always performed highly impactful and innovative science. So our institute ranks and the top 1.5% of research institutes worldwide in citations per paper. So we really do outstanding science. So if that's your goal, if your goal is to really do science at, at the front end of biomedical research, if you really want to do really top-notch science, so this is a bit an institute that you should consider. You should consider training with us. As, uh, as Seb also said, well, we are a rather a small institute. We have 40 faculty and research group uh, groups uh, uh, here. That uh, means we have around 350 researchers, which involve uh, graduate students. We have our own graduate school program. We have postdocs and scientific staff. So we are large, large enough to have all the resources that you need to do really the best science you can do out there. But we are also small enough that you're not going to be just a number here. You really get to know the majority of your colleagues here. And that's, that's instrumental. All this networking that you can do, meeting all these colleagues at the Institute is instrumental for, for your future career. So, so that's a great thing. We are, we are on the smaller side. And also we have no bureaucracy. So basically you, anything that you need here, if you have a problem, if you have a question, you just pick up a phone, talk to someone, things get done very easily. And you cannot say that from many other places. So that's a great thing about working here. It's, it's very easy to get things done. We are also extremely collaborative, so we collaborate a lot with our own uh, labs, but also uh, with external lab in the area and outside. And we are extremely productive. So last year, for example, we published 240 peer review papers, which is an, an amazing achievement for, for an institute that has 40 research groups. So it's really a lot of papers. But as, as uh, Seb said, we basically do a combination of basic and translational research. So most of our labs do fundamental basic research and interested in understanding the physiology of different cellular processes, the mechanisms of disease. But we have a strong emphasis in translating this basic research into uh, potential therapies for the benefit of patients. And, and this is very clear from the number of patents that we have from the Institute. There are over a thousand uh, patents uh, that were uh, generated at the Institute from the research done here. 35 startups have started from work done at the Institute. We have FDA approved treatments and tests and several undergoing clinical trials. So we really try to move our basic research into, into therapies. And we can do that because we have this amazing uh, resource, which is the Conrad Previs Center for Chemical Genomics, or uh, also known as the Previs Center. So this is one of the most advanced drug discovery centers in the world. And there's no no profit that has a center for drug discovery like what we have. And these centers allow us to really move this basic research into potential uh, therapies. And the great thing is that if you train here, you will learn both. You will develop skills in basic and translational research. And considering the current you know, research market, this is an amazing advantage that you will have uh, if you train with us. Um, also, we have state-of-the-art research facilities. Uh, you will hear about them. Uh, uh, and we have an amazing Office of Education that provides uh, uh, opportunities for, for, for professional training and, and development. And, and they, they offer workshops, courses, as we will hear today, in grant writing, uh, leadership, many, many opportunities that you will have to, to, to uh, develop professionally. 
Uh, we also got fellowships. You will hear today about our main uh, or biggest programs, which are the T32 NIH sponsor uh, uh, training grants. But we also have other fellowships that you will be able to apply if you are if you are at the institute, besides the one that you can apply outside. And one amazing thing is also where we are located. So we are located in San Diego, in La Jolla, which is home for top academic research institutions. So really, walking distance from our institute is the University of California, San Diego, the Scripps Research Institute just across the street, Salk Institute, La Jolla Immunology. So all these amazing research institutions, they are walking distance from us and we have very strong connections with them. We do joint seminars and joint events, meetings, we have collaborations with them, we really interact, we have an amazing network of academic research. But San Diego is also one of the largest biotech pharma clusters in the US. And there's over 1300 companies in this area. And you can see it here in this, in this map here, we are located in the middle of it. So there's, this is as an example of, of the companies that are around us. In blue, you could see large pharma. In red, you see small biotech startups, uh, different companies. So we are in the middle of that. And that provides endless opportunities for, learn, uh, for learning and networking. It's just an amazing uh, uh, environment to do science. Uh, and last but not least, one thing that's very, very important is that if you train with, with us in, in, at the Sanford Barna Province, you will be living in San Diego, which is an incredible place to live. So San Diego is you know, one of the top vacation destinations in the US and you will be living here uh, your entire year. So that's not a small thing. Uh, and you can see here, for example, it's the people in my lab working hard during the week, but they also enjoy the beach uh, during the weekends, have beautiful beaches, sunsets. You can surf, you can do whatever uh, you want uh, it, it outdoors. It's really an amazing place to live, one of the best places to live in the US. Uh, so I think I went a little over time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it to Diane, that will tell you more specifically about opportunities for, for education at our institute. Uh, and let me stop sharing this, and thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Max. Um, and no worries, I can speak just as quickly as you can, so um, we'll, we'll make up the time. So I'm really happy to um, thank you, Nisha, for getting off of that first slide. I didn't want to spend much time with showing everybody pictures of ourselves. So she knows me well. We've worked together for many, many years. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking um, about this slide, the Institute mission. Um, as Max mentioned, I am Diane. Um, my name is Diane Klotz. I'm director of the Office of Education Training and International Services. And the reason I highlighted this slide is simply to underscore what um, Dr. Renai and Dr. D'Angelo have already talked about, which is that um, postdoctoral training at Sanford Burnham Prebis is not just an afterthought or just a consequence of doing biomedical research. It is actually part of our mission here at Sanford Burnham Prebis. And um, our mission and the way we accomplish our mission includes um, a four-pronged model. And on the next slide, we're gonna focus um, just on the third prong, which is where education and training fits in. So um, it specifically says in our strategic plan that we will educate and train the next generation of scientists. And this has to do with not only the high quality biomedical research that's already, already been mentioned, but um, training in that research. Increasing our educational and training programs to include a continuum of biomedical discovery and development, so both basic and translational research, and also um, developing opportunities for our students and our postdoc to grow in not only their research training, but in the areas of entrepreneurship, leadership, and communication. So this is something that the Institute holds um, very strongly to and feels is a very important part of the culture at Sanford Burnham Prebis. So where does this Office of Education Training and International Services fit in? Well, it's our role to ensure that for all the excellent biomedical research training that our postdocs and students are getting in the laboratory, we are complementing this with all the resources and opportunities that they need to be successful in their chosen career path. So on the next slide, I'm just going to highlight briefly what encompasses the office, and I'll refer it to I'll refer to it as OTIS, um, which is the acronym, and much much easier to pronounce all the time. So OTIS is comprised of three main functional areas. One is graduate education. So we have our graduate school of biomedical sciences and a single PhD program in the biomedical sciences. It encompasses the area of postdoctoral training, so supporting our T32s, 
all of the training that goes on in individual laboratories, as well as the career and professional development, which um, Dr. Nisha Kavanaugh is going to talk about in a moment, and then also international services. So we have a very strong community of international scientists at the Institute, not the least of which are our postdocs. And we have a very solid support system in place within Otis to support um, the activities and visa requirements and travel and training of all of our international scholars. So I just like to highlight on one more slide before I hand it over to Nisha, that it is the Otis mission to support the career development and enhance the training experience of all of our scientists in training here at the Institute. And we have everything from summer interns um, right on up to post postdoctoral um, training positions. And so the office provides career and professional development at all levels, and it allows our postdocs to interact with those scientists at all levels and provides them with mentoring opportunities as well as their own growth and development opportunities. So how we do that, um, I'm going to turn over to Dr. Nisha Kavanaugh and she's gonna take you through um, an overview of all the different support services that we provide here at the Institute. Thanks, Diane. So as, was, as Diane mentioned, um, Otis provides current professional development programming throughout the year. And several of us on the Otis team have biomedical PhDs ourselves. And we use that education and training to develop these workshops and programs specifically tailored for postdocs and early career PhDs. The programs and workshops that we offer are free to the postdocs at Sanford Burnham Previs. And our formal programs help you to develop your skills towards reaching your research goals. Additionally, we offer workshops to help you prepare for any career path you choose. And these events are offered in person when we can, um, more recently virtually and on demand, which means that these are pre-recorded videos that postdocs have access to at any time and can be able to uh, to get that information on their own time. So that, that really gives um, flexibility with the um, expectations of your research and other obligations that you may have. And as was mentioned, uh, we provide many opportunities to network pro with professionals within the Institute on the Torrey Pines Mesa as part of the Torrey Pines Training Consortium in collaboration with Salk, Scripps, and UC San Diego. We provide opportunities to network with San Diego professionals and worldwide. And I'll mention our leadership program in a few minutes. And Otis services and support help you with preparing your manuscripts, fellowship applications, and presentations. Um, our career and professional development workshops cover all of the topics listed um, here to maximize your postdoc training here at the Institute. And these topics, can range from research related to developing transferable skills that you can use in any career path you use, as well as in preparation for that next step that you take in your career. I'd like to highlight six of our premier programs that are uniquely offered at Sanford Burnham Previs. Our comprehensive grant writing workshop series provides, with, provides postdocs with information and resources on developing an effective research plan and training plan, understanding the submission process here at the Institute, as well as uh, present you with information about the review and study section processes with an emphasis on NIH funding mechanisms. Several of our postdocs have pursued and obtained their own funding, either through NIH or through many of the foundations. These workshop series are um, presented by several of the faculty here at the Institute, and uh, several of them participate in a mock study section to help you see what the discussion is like around an F32 fellowship proposal, for example. Our comprehensive manuscript writing workshop series covers the life cycle of a manuscript, from writing it and selecting the right journal to the peer review process and responding to reviewer comments. Our academic and industry career tracks provide information and resources to help you navigate each of these career paths. And we connect you with Sanford Burnham Previs alumni 
and PhD profess professionals who have successfully obtained tenure track faculty positions or jobs in industry. On the next few slides, I'll focus on these last two uh, programs, the Tory Pines Leadership Development Program and the Art of Science Communication course. In addition, uh, several of these programs, we offer a certificate of completion, and that's something that you can put on your CV or resume when you are ready to apply for jobs. So the Tory Pines Leadership Development Program is a one-year program based on a cohort model to create an instant network of like-minded individuals. The program is founded on increasing your awareness of your leadership strengths and leadership style, understanding the uh, leadership styles of others and how to work with them for mutual benefit, learning how to effectively communicate and manage conflict with others, and then using that information to really build and sustain an effective team. Major topics that are integrated into the program in the context of leadership include communication, conflict management, influencing, and negotiation. This year, we have 31 participants from five local institutions in the San Diego area and nine institutions worldwide. Six Sanford Burnham Prebis postdocs are currently enrolled in this year's program. And since the inception of, our, of this program, we've been running it since 2016, 50 of our postdocs have completed the program. So here's a photo from last year's cohort. The pandemic gave us an opportunity to expand our reach and invite postdocs from all over the world to participate in this program. Based on feedback from our program participants, we will launch a second program called Expanding Leadership in 2022 to further build on the foundation of the first program, and it will be offered virtually as well to our program alumni. For any of you who are familiar with the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, or ASBMB, you may know that there is an Art of Science communication course that's offered online. One of the PIs at Sanford Burnham Previs, Dr. Hudson Fries, helped design the online course. And it presents the, um, our institution with a unique opportunity to offer this course as a hybrid, where we combine the online material from ASBMB with guided in-person discussion sessions with Dr. Fries. The course provides expert training and hands-on experience to enhance participants' ability to present science in non-technical language with the goal to increase the public's understanding of and comfort with science and scientists, as well as for scientists to um, have a better appreciation for where the public's perception is and attitudes are towards science. ASBMB off, uh, will provide a certificate of completion upon com um, the participants who complete this course. Listed here are several of our of Otis's services and support that complement the programming that I've already talked to you about. I'm not going to go through the list, but I wanted you to be aware of these uh, services and support that are offered to all of our postdocs, as well as our international scholars throughout the year. In collaboration with our postdoc association, the SBP Science Network fosters a sense of commu postdoc community through various events, including our annual symposium, National Postdoc Appreciation Week, and virtual events such as trivia and coffee breaks. In order to uh, have our postdocs come together, especially during the pandemic. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, there are um, funding mechanisms that are unique to Sanford Burnham Previs. These are the Fishman Fund Awards, and they were established in honor of the Institute's founders, Dr. William and Lillian Fishman, who appreciated the significant impact that postdocs have on medical research and were dedicated to fostering the career development of young scientists at the Institute. These include a two-year fellowship, which provides salary support higher than the California salary minimum, and our um, and the fellowship is established to award postdocs with a vision and plan to contribute to the Institute mission and be part of the next big discovery. Also, we have a career development award, which is offered every year and supports the career um, development activities of several of our postdocs. 
The award is given to postdocs who have a clearly articulated goal and well-described plan for how they will succeed in that career path. And so on both of these slides, I just uh, wanted to highlight the latest recipients from for the fellowship and the career development award. Lastly, I want to take a moment to show you where our postdocs go after they leave Sanford Burnham Previs. This is just um, a small a subset of our postdoc alumni. These are individuals who went through the Fishman Fund um, program, either through the um, Career Development Award or through the fellowship. And, uh, but it does um, give a sample size that is reflective of our postdoc, commun uh, postdoc community, where um, we have individuals who go uh, to academia, whether within the US or um, uh, outside of the US. And, postdocs who pursue um, research related and research intensive careers in industry. And here's a snapshot of the companies, universities and institutions that these postdocs have gone to in the last five years. With that, I will um, turn it over to Dr. Fabiana um, Lang, who will talk to you about the diversity, equity and um, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives here at the Institute. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you, Nisha, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Fabiana Lang. I'm a postdoc at Dr. Nicholas Cosford Lab, and I'm also the co-chair of the Education and Training Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, which operates under the Office of Education Training International Services to promote a training environment that respects all of our scientific trainees' identities. In addition to the Education and Training DI Committee, uh, Sanford Burnham Previs has other three uh, DI committees, Learning, Recruitment, and Cancer Center, that operate independently. However, the DI Council uh, brings together reps from each one of the committees to best coordinate institute-wide DI initiatives, leverage resources, and strategize on how to best advance DI efforts at the Institute. So specifically about the Education and Training Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Commission Committee, our mission is to support all scientific trainees at Sanford Burn and Previs by recommending and implementing strategies that specifically address the needs of our trainee population and to promote an inclusive and equitable training culture that values diversity. Our committee is comprised of postdocs, graduate students, faculty, staff scientists, the Dean of the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences, uh, a rep from the Office of Education Training International Services, and a representative of our uh, communications department. So we want to assure that everyone who is directly or indirectly involved in scientific training is well informed on the practices and recommendations. So as I said, our activities involve, uh, involve making recommendations to the Graduate Program Executive Committee and the Postdoc Training Advisory Group, PTEC, regarding DI practices. We also provide DI-focused learning opportunities. We collaborate with DI committees of other research institutions on key initiatives, and we serve as a safe space for students and postdocs to bring concerns or grievances on which we might act on a we might act on a case by case basis. As an example of our DI focused learning opportunities, last year we invited Dr. Jabbar Bennett, who's currently the uh, vice president and chief diversity officer of Michigan State University, to discuss how diversity and inclusion impacts research training and mentoring. Uh, we also partnered with uh, who it is now the learning committee. Uh, to organize a virtual screening and discussion of the documentary Picture a Scientist that addresses gender bias and sexual harassment in STEM. We also have our own seminar series, which are uh, sponsored by the Office of Education and Training International Services. And in those seminars, we bring uh, scientists at different career levels to showcase their research and also to join us in DI topics uh, discussions. For example, our last, uh, our last event to celebrate Pride Month, uh, we had Dr. Gerald Joyce, uh, a professor at the Salk Institute, 
join us uh, in a panel to discuss the importance of allyship to support and advance LGBTQ plus individuals in STEM. As an example of our uh, external collaborations, we partner with UCSD DAZO, Diversity in Science Lecture Series. So this is another opportunity in, you, in which our trainees can uh, show, can present their science to a broader scientific audience. And they, can, they also have the opportunity to talk about their personal journey in science and how their different backgrounds have influenced their research. And with that, I want to thank you one more time to join our event. I, would to, uh, I want to thank my PI and the members of the Cosford Lab, the Education and Training DI Committee, and the Office of Education Training International Services. Later, I'll be happy to uh, answer your questions about my own experience as a postdoc or about the committee. And I want to welcome uh, Dr. Craig Hauser, to, uh, who is our uh, VP of Scientific Resources. Thank you. Um, hi, so uh, again, my name is Craig Hauser. I oversee the uh, scientific resources, including the core system at Sanford Burnham Prebis. And I wanna give you a little bit of flavor about that. Um, I wanna phrase this as a question for you, which you should be thinking about if you're looking at where you want to do your training, which is what technology resources beyond my lab and its friends will be available at the institution I wanna to go to? And how will this accelerate my research progress? And also how will it, give me an, will it give me access to training and to cutting edge technologies to use and learn about? And I think the answer at Sanford Burnham Prebus is there is a strong and, and well-equipped core system that provides both research services and training in the use of their advanced instruments. So I wanna just tell you a little bit about what we have in a whirlwind tour. Uh, we have 10 shared resources. Uh, one is a very large one, which is our animal resources, which takes care of all the animal husbandry, uh, sets up breeding, does injections, in vivo imaging, tumor analysis, um, really very comprehensive services there. Um, uh, for cell imaging and histology, we have all different kinds of microscopes in the core, including super resolution, confocal. Uh, we do live cell time-lapse imaging. Uh, the histology portion does tissue sectioning, staining, archiving, and analysis, and also helps researchers with human tissue procurement. Uh, structural biology has a wide range of, of sort of facilities, including the protein biophysical analysis, cryo-EM, and infrastructure supporting crystallography and NMR. Uh, we have a well-equipped flow cytometry core that does both analytical flow and also cell sorting. Um, genomics does uh, next-gen sequencing and all the usual sort of transcriptome, exome, chip seq, et cetera. They also support single cell sequencing with two different instruments, and we're now developing spatial transcriptomics. Um, proteomics is a really well-equipped core that does everything from ID of proteins in simple samples all the way to proteome-wide analysis of post-translational modifications. Um, the chemical library screening core is really part of what others have already described as the uh, Prebis Center which allows this drug development center at our institute, which allows for people to do assay development. There are large compound libraries. They do high throughput screening, high content screening, medicinal chemistry follow-up, and then also uh, various uh, PK and other sorts of analyses of these compounds in animals. Uh, the bioinformatics core has some skilled people who can help with data analysis, data mining, and sort of just making sense out of all of the powerful omics data from the cores I've already described. Uh, functional genomics has uh, libraries to knock out and screen genes with a variety of mechanisms using uh, siRNAs all the way up through CRISPR libraries, which is now the increasing focus, both pooled and arrayed. Uh, so they do assay development and help with high throughput screening of using various libraries. They also do cell engineering, cell line engineering and produce viral vectors. And finally, we have uh, cancer metabolism, which looks at various metabolites, analyzes metabolic flux 
and also does cellular respiration in live cells. Oops, what happened here? Having trouble advancing. Okay, uh, the last slide is just some important features of, of our cores. And I think an important one is that they're highly accessible. Um, so the cores are staffed by people whose job it is to provide service in the core and to help all people who come to the core in an equitable manner. Um, the reason I stress this is that many places have cores that are really an extension of a PI's lab, and it's much harder to actually get help when you need it. Um, so the full-time core directors that we have are really, they're ex the experts. They're mostly postdoc trained researchers. They're the, the technology experts at our institute and people come to them. And in addition to providing training and service, they also provide assistance in grant writing, manuscript writing, uh, experimental design and data analysis, and even helping you to interpret what the data might mean in the context of their technology. Um, as I mentioned before, most cores offer a choice of full service or training and then independent use of the equipment. And that really often depends on whether it's a passing thing that you need to get done or whether it's a central part of what you're working on in terms of whether you want to just have it done or, or be trained how to do it yourself. And finally, uh, the systems are for the, the services are affordable. Um, that's in part because we are an NCI designated cancer center. So the cores are subsidized by the Institute's Cancer Center Support Grant, as well as by the Institute. So that's sort of a whirlwind tour of the cores. And um, I guess I, uh, I'll turn it over to Linda Bradley, who will talk about the T32 that she leads. Oh, okay. All right, hello, my name is Linda Bradley, and I'm going to introduce now the T32 programs and training presentations that are going to be following. So we have two T32 programs, one in immunology specifically, but also involves many aspects of other diseases, including cancer. My presentation on that program will be followed by two presentations from trainees in this particular program. And then I'm going to hand it over to Nicholas Cosford, who uh, heads the Cancer Targets and Drug Discovery, T32, and two trainees that will be speaking in that uh, presentation. All right. Okay, so I'm Linda Bradley. I'm an immunologist and the leader of the Fundamental and Translational Immunology T32. Uh, I, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you this very exciting uh, training opportunity. I wanna highlight that not only am I a program director in the aging cancer and immuno-oncology program, but I'm also part of the infectious and inflammatory diseases program. And our immunology T32 does encompass many other aspects of immunology that touch on inflammation, chronic diseases, and so on. As many of you may be aware, it's the field of immunology has simply exploded in the past few years at an astounding pace. And this is partly because of many uh, important, it's now recognized that many human conditions such as even obesity and heart disease have inflammatory components that involve cells of the immune system and that can be targeted to improve patient outcomes. So our goal is to train the next generation of leading scientists who possess a critical and broad understanding of immunology and a practical appreciation of how this knowledge can be applied to formulate new approaches to treat human disease. So the central scientific theme of our immunology T32 is to understand the integration of innate and adaptive responses to pathogens to achieve lasting immunity and to use that knowledge to modulate the deleterious or ineffective responses. The cells of the immune system are collectively known as white blood cells and many of the cell types that are involved in the immune system are shown here. Cells of the innate immune system shown on the left are, are the ones that sense invading pathogens by recognizing microbial products with receptors on their surfaces. And these are the first line of defense against pathogens. 
the uh, innate immune system also contributes to the development of adaptive immunity, which is the pathogen specific targeted responses. And these involve antibody production by B cells and T cells that produce mediators with uh, antimicrobial properties in addition to cytotoxic T cell activity. So our aim is to use these fundamental studies to develop novel therapeutic approaches and to test these in animal models of preclinical pre -clinical models of disease, and then to extend them to translation. So this is the organization of our program. The fundamental and at the top is the trainee and the trainee's preceptor or preceptors and their research program. And this interfaces with the program leadership with primarily this the steering committee. And then we have additional components within the program that um, advance our training. So the program elements include mentoring and upon appointment to the program, a mentoring committee is established. This committee includes the preceptors and uh, also another other faculty members that may be chosen to complement the expertise. We have a clinical component because it's especially important for young research researchers to be cognizant of the impact of their work on human health and unmet clinical needs. Therefore, we have recruited a panel of physician colleagues from USD to participate as co-mentors. So a co-mentor is um, in consultation with the steering committee, a co-mentor is paired with the, uh, a clinical mentor with whom there are shared interests. In addition to that, we have a number of courses and workshops and conferences. You've heard a bit about these already, but these are the ones that have been specifically detailed in the Immunology T32. And you'll see that in the upper right, there are uh, things that are completely unique to the frontiers in immunology. And these are very helpful for the drug discovery, early stage drug discovery, and of course, importantly, exploring opportunities and career opportunities that are maybe outside of academics that you're so familiar with at this point. We have other courses that were uh, mentioned by Nisha. And one of the things that's important these days is research ethics. We, have, we hear a lot about rigor and transparency in scientific research. We have statistics, data analysis, and you already heard about the grant writing, postdoc leadership, and so forth. We also have, on top of this, lab-specific journal clubs. Uh, we have, as part of the Immunity and Pathogenesis Program, a research in progress uh, seminar series. We have the SBP Annual Postdoc Scientific Symposium that you've already heard about. But we also have the yearly La Jolla Immunology Conference, which is every um, October, typically, uh, when there's not a pandemic. And this gets together the very broad uh, immuno uh, immunology uh, component. We have immunologists at all several institutions, and they come together to share their work. Now, most of you, I think, have had the opportunity to go on our website and, uh, and go through the um, the various mentors that are shown here for the Immunology T32. Uh, if you haven't had the chance, please take the opportunity to go on the website and um, go to the individual web pages. They are linked to the individual mentor's name to see you know, the breadth of research that's being done for our uh, Immunology T32. And at this point, I'd like to uh, move to the postdoc trainee uh, his presentations first will be by John Grist. He's going to introduce why he's, uh, what work he's doing, and in addition to that, how he has benefited from the T32 postdoctoral training. And his, he will be followed by uh, Jennifer Hope, who will then be presenting her studies. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, John Grist. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral associate in uh, Dr. Carl Ware's lab uh, in the Infectious and Inf Inflammatory Disease Research Center here at Sanford Bernard Previs. Um, my talk today uh, will be on uh, SOM5 and neuronal player in the HM inflammatory network. Uh, and I was a recipient of the T32 Frontiers in Fundamental and Translational Immunology Program. 
Um, so I wanted to give a little bit of background on um, who I am and how I got here. Uh, so I uh, got my bachelor's of science in honors in chemistry and concentration of biochemistry uh, with two minors in both physics and biology from San Jose State University. It's in Northern California in 2012. Um, my, uh, I did some research when I was there uh, under the direction of Dr. Elaine Collins, and that was on the interaction of tar RNA and TAP peptides in bovine immunodeficiency virus. Uh, I then went on to get my PhD from the University of Utah School of Medicine in Microbiology and Immunology in 2017 uh, under the advisory of Dr. Tom Lane. Uh, and my dissertation title was CXCL1 and CXCR2, Signaling Access and Disease Progression in Preclinical Animal Models of Multiple Sclerosis. Um, so why did I join uh, SBP? Uh, so uh, when I was looking for a postdoc, I was really interested in finding something that would kind of transition me into eventually going into industry or into a pharmaceutical company. And um, for, when I interviewed at different places, many of the, the interviews that I had uh, other than here uh, were all purely academic. And many of my peers also uh, had purely academic research, although many of them wanted to go into a pharmaceutical company or an in industry uh, after they finished their postdoc. Um, so when I interviewed with uh, Carl Ware, I, I explicitly stated what I was interested in, uh, which was to go into that. And um, uh, he was uh, very receptive to that and was very interested in me uh, joining the lab um, uh, due to that. And I think that it was very beneficial for me to join uh, also because uh, the senior uh, postdocs who have now uh, graduated or kind of moved on to the uh, and finished their postdoc and and went into um, their next position uh, are at companies uh, such as uh, Pfizer as well as J&J. &J. Um, so in relation to that unique uh, opportunity that you get, um, I was able, I'm able to work on multiple projects here, including both fundamental as well as pharma collaboration research. Um, so my fundamental research projects, which the one I'll talk about today was the Sound 5 HVN signaling access. Um, as well as uh, last year after the start of the um, pandemic, uh, we, I was able to uh, assist in, in helping write a R01 grant, which was uh, subsequently granted uh, on uh, lymphotoxin network control of coronavirus airway infection. Uh, and I was able to utilize some of this, uh, the research I did in, uh, during grad school, which incorporated cr other coronavirus uh, research uh, to help uh, write that grant. Um, in addition, uh, the collaborations with uh, Pharma, uh, I'm involved on two uh, projects uh, with Eli Lilly and Company. Um, those uh, include one project which I'm uh, helping lead, which is uh, uh, to, uh, which they're both to help target uh, discovery for novel targets and therapeutics for autoimmune diseases. Uh, so a little bit about into uh, what I am doing and what our lab kind of works on. Uh, so uh, HVM is the central molecule that we study, uh, which includes both activating and inhibitory pathways. Uh, HVM stands for herpes virus entry mediator, also known as TNF receptor superfamily 14. It's expressed in uh, lymphocytes as well as macrophages, endothelial and epithelial cells. Uh, and it can be activating uh, both by uh, light and lymphotoxin alpha as well as it can be inhibitory uh, from immunoglobulin and superfamily molecules, BTLA and CD160. Um, light can be activated uh, uh, when, when HM is as a, a receptor, uh, which is activating an NF-kappa B response, uh, in, inducing inflammation. In addition, HM can also act as a ligand and interact with uh, molecules such as BTLA and induce a SHIP2 signal through both BNT cells and B inhibitory. Uh, both HVM and uh, BTLA can be bidirectional, meaning that HVM can act as either a ligand or a receptor, um, which can give this bidirectional signaling. So if HVM acts as a uh, receptor, it can also induce a survival factor through the, the cell that it's being activated on, um, both through BTLA and CD160. Uh, HVM has been involved in many different pathways, including cancer, autoimmune diseases, as well as infectious diseases. Um, a little bit about uh, the other molecule on that aspect, which was SOUND5. Uh, so SOUND5 was found in 2016 to be interacting also with HVM, 
Um, SOM5 stands for synaptic antigen molecule number five. There's five molecules in that family. Um, SOM5 is expressed mainly on neurons and is involved normally in a process or has been studied norm previously has been involved in neural outgrowth and synaptic formation in a process called presynaptic differentiation. Um, SOM5 does this through its interaction with RPTBs. Uh, the most studied one there is with RPTB delta. It's a receptor protein tyrosine phosphatase delta. Um, and uh, SOM5 has been known to be involved in dampening neuroinflammation, as well as it been, has been associated with uh, diseases such as autism and schizophrenia. Uh, so what are some of the goals of this project? Uh, so uh, one of the goals is to understand, is SOM5 and HM inducing a bidirectional signal similar to how BTLA is interacting or CD160? Uh, or is it just mon monodirectional and it's signaling? And how is that working? Um, how, as well as uh, what structural motifs and what amino acids in particular are important in the interaction of SOM5 and HM, uh, as well as what's the impact of SOM5 on the immune system within the brain. Uh, in addition, uh, what, how does SOM5 and HM interaction play a role in, both in neurotrophic uh, viruses? So when there's viral inf in infection within the brain, uh, how is that uh, involved? as well as does the modulation of this pathway uh, alter neuroinflammation and or neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, so what has the uh, T32 uh, grant here at SVP done for me? So first, I, the T32 grant uh, really helped me with being able to even work on the, this project I spoke about, the HMN SOM5 project. Um, I was, when I first joined the lab, uh, that project was kind of on a standstill. And when I was able to uh, get the grant, I was able to start working on this uh, project. In addition, uh, there's many courses that are uh, required and involved. And uh, the, probably the most important one or the one that helped me the most was the leadership course that the Otis group talked about earlier today. Um, that class really helped me understand both myself and how my, my personality and how um, I can actually create a team and interact with others. Um, and utilizing that uh, when, we, when we obtained the R01 grant and got more uh, people to, on our team to uh, work on, on the coronavirus research, uh, I was able to, it was able to really help me with uh, my leadership skills in, in keeping a team together and, and getting the goals done um, uh, to the best of our abilities. Uh, so thank you for uh, listening to my uh, brief talk today. Uh, and I'm open to questions in the Q&A as well as the, the, meet, the short meeting afterwards. Thank you. Okay, at this time, we're gonna have Jennifer Hope uh, who will be joining us. Uh, and she's gonna be talking about her work at, that she's completed on the T32. And I'd like to say that she has been able to secure a prestigious American Cancer Society fellowship. So she's now moved off of the T32. So Jenna, I give it to you. Thank you, Linda. I'm just trying to get my video started here. So can everyone see my screen? Great. So it's really a pleasure to be here today speaking with you and to share just a little bit about my experience as a postdoc and a T32 fellow here at SVP. So again, um, I'm a postdoc fellow. I was on the T32. I am currently part of the Aging Cancer and Immuno-Oncology Program, and my mentor is Linda Bradley. So before jumping into the science, I'd like to share just a little bit about myself and how I came to SVP. So I received my bachelor's in science in biology with a minor in biostatistics from our science college back in 2010. I then joined Drexel College University Medicine in Philadelphia in 2011, where my research focus was exploring the roles of microRNAs in the development of effector memory and exhausted CD8 T cells. And I split my time between Drexel and Erasmus University Medical Center in the Netherlands to complete my PhD in microbiology and immunology in 2017. And then after I finished that, I came here to Stanford Burnham Previs so I could join Linda's lab and continue my studies into the regulators of T cell exhaustion. 
I joined the T32 program as an inaugural fellow in 2018 and was part of that until 2020 when I received, as Linda mentioned, an American Cancer Society Fellowship Award. Now, while I've been a postdoc here, I've been honored to receive both the Fishman Fund Postdoctoral De uh, Career Development Award, as well as the Eric Duddle Postdoctoral Award for Cancer Research. I'm also active in the SVP community as well. I've served as a member of PTAG, the Postdoc Training Advisory Group since 2019. Um, the, beginning this fall, I'll be a visiting lecturer in the SVP Graduate School for Biomedical Science. And I'm also a regular participant in many of the Otis workshops that Nisha and Diane were mentioning. And like John, I really wanna highlight the Tory Pines Leadership Development course. And um, for me in particular, the many academic career track workshops that Otis has held, which has been really helpful in trying to launch my own independent academic career. So overall, I found SVP to be a really supportive and encouraging environment for both my personal career development as well as my research mentors. And I'm really glad that I chose SVP and Linda's lab to complete my postdoc training. Now, research-wise, a major portion of my time here at SVP has been focused on exploring how a molecule called PSGL1 can also serve as a regulator of T-cell exhaustion during chronic infection and cancer because PSGL1 was first identified to be a cell adhesion molecule, so not something that you would think would go hand in hand with exhaustion. Now, throughout this work, we've used or worked with several of the cores of the Institute that Craig mentioned, and I've denoted these cores in the bottom corners of the relevant slides. So in the breakout sessions, if you want to talk about how a particular core was relevant to this work, I'm happy to discuss further. Now, T-cell exhaustion is a phenomena observed in both mice and humans in response to chronic antigen exposure, such as during chronic virus infection or cancer. And really, it refers to the progressive loss of the function of T-cells the upregulation of negative re regulators called inhibitor receptors, and eventually it promotes the death of these cells. Now, previous studies in the Bradley lab had identified that mice deficient in PSGL1 were able to control the chronic virus infection LCMV clone 13. We also found that we could control the growth of melanoma tumors from a BRAF-P10 mutated YUM1.5 melanoma tumor cell line. Now, under these conditions, we observed that both CD4 and CD8 T cells demonstrated decreased expression of these inhibitor receptors, including PD1, CD160, and BTLA, all markers of T cell exhaustion upon sustained expression, as well as enhanced functionality as determined by increased interferon gamma and TNF alpha cytokine production. Importantly, we found that when we block PSGL1 signaling in vivo, that this was sufficient to significantly inhibit the growth of that melanoma tumor model, which is a model that's resistant to the current PD-1 treatments. We also found that we increased TCL infiltration using this blockade method. However, it's still unclear at that point in time how PSGL1 could be driving this phenotype, and that served as the basic question driving the last few years of research. Now, because T-cell receptor signaling drives the activation and differentiation of T-cells, we obsessed this activation status at increasing concentrations of CD3, and we found essentially that these cells were more activated. So we then employed an in vitro exhaustion model to evaluate these T-cells in a different way. And essentially what we found is that under the exhaustive conditions in vitro, our PSG1 deficient T-cells were able to retain better cytokine production than the wild type control cells. And bringing it back to the T-cell receptor signaling, we used a couple different types or variants of a peptide in order to assess the TCR signaling affinity. And what we found is that when we use this lower affinity variant, we were able to really maintain a high amount of cytokine production by our PSG1 knockout cells, as opposed to the control cells, which still demonstrate high levels of exhaustion. This was all done using flow cytometry, which allows us to assess the cytokine production on a per cell basis by the T cells. Because we observed a link between activation status, you know, we really wanted to assess the localization of these molecules, CD3, which is the T cell receptor, and PSGL1. 
And to do these studies, we used histology, of, I'm sorry, fluorescent microscopy, which we were able to do in our own lab, as well as use an advanced machine called an amnes image stream available in the flow cytometry, which allowed us to assess these cells on a per cell basis and calculate a positive, a percent positive similarity score. And really that allowed us to look at the co-localization like we can with fluorescent microscopy, but on a much wider scale, more high throughput. Basically what these studies showed us is that if we co-ligated CD3 and PSGL1, that they formed this cap on the surface of the cell. So we then used phosphoproteomics to analyze all phosphorylation changes occurring within 15 minutes of T-cell activation with plate-bound anti-CD3 in association with the proteomics core. These heat maps of selected genes indicate the high level of enhanced phosphorylation of molecules associated with T-cell signaling and responsiveness of our ps 2 knockout T-cells. We also performed GSEA analysis, which showed the upregulation of genes associated with TCR signaling in our knockout cells, such as the ERK map kinase pathway shown here on the right. So since these data demonstrated a link to those early changes in PS2 on deficient T cells, we wanted to do a seq to look and see if there were any chromatin changes that we could observe early after activation. So we did this analysis in association with the bioinformatics core. And one of the great things about SVP is the highly collaborative environment. So many thanks to our collaboration with the Adams lab who assisted with this analysis. And so basically what we found is that we've, when we focused our attention on known regulators of TCR signaling, we identified a particular gene, which I refer to here simply as GOI, as this is unpublished data, which is significantly more closed off in our PSG1 knockout T cells. Now, since this particular gene is a negative regulator of TCR signaling, we hypothesize that the lack of this regulator promotes the increased TCR signaling sensitivity that I referred to in the earlier slides. Now, how do we link this to what the actual function of the cell is? So we know that changes in T cell metabolism are driven by TCR signaling and that exhausted T cells have impaired glycolysis. So in association with the cancer metabolism core, we assessed the glycolytic capability of our wild type and knockout T cells under effector and exhausted conditions. And what we see here are the proton efflux rates or the glycoproton efflux rates, which is a measure of glycolysis. And in red, we have our knockout cells and in black, we have our wild type. And what was clear to us from these data is that under both effector and exhausted conditions, our knockout cells maintain a higher level of glycolysis, which could be one of the mechanisms that are establishing and retaining the enhanced cytokine production observed by our knockout cells. So finally, to confirm that this increased glycolysis was not simply an artifact of in vitro activation, we performed single cell sequencing on adoptively transferred wild type and ps one knockout intratumoral CD8 T cells. These cells were sorted from B16 ova tumors in mice. Our unbiased Chisney analysis shows that for the most part, the wild type and knockout cells cluster independently, wild type shown in blue and the knockout shown in red. And ultimately what these data on the right confirm is that when we have um, our knockout cells, we see increased expression of not only genes associated with effector function, interferon gamma and granzyme B, but also genes associated with metabolism, PGAM1, LDOA, ENA1, and LDHA. Therefore, these data corroborated our observations with the seahorse analysis. So in summary, with the data I've shared with you today, as well as other data not shown, Basically what we have found is that PS2 on deficiency promotes enhanced T cell responses in vivo during chronic, chronic virus infection and cancer. If we have therapeutic blockade of PSGL1, we've found that this limits the development of T cell exhaustion and it promotes virus control and tumor growth control. Our PSGL1 deficient CD8 T cells demonstrate enhanced TCR signaling and a lower threshold for activation. And our knockout cells retain cytokine production despite repeated antigenic stimulation and have an intent, increased retention of glycolysis even under exhausted conditions. So again, thank you for joining us today and for your time and attention. I'd like to just briefly share my gratitude for the members of the Bradley Lab and our many collaborators who have contributed to this work. 
And with that, I'd now, now like to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Nicholas Cosford. He's a professor here at SBP and deputy director of the Cancer Center, as well as head of the Cancer Targets and Drug Discovery T32. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, I had to remember to unmute myself there for a moment. So um, my, my colleagues have uh, really described many of the advantages of working at SPP as a postdoc or a grad student. Um, I'm showing on this slide some of the data we have with respect to this combination of outstanding basic science coupled with our ability to literally move uh, new medicines from the uh, lab bench into the clinic. And in fact, um, there's a press release that just came out. We've actually um, moved a drug into uh, phase one clinical studies in the past few weeks. Uh, we also have a cancer drug that is moving forward towards the clinic as well. So this is not, uh, this is real, okay? So we are really doing, we're taking basic science, we're moving forward. Uh, I want to commend uh, Jonathan and Jennifer on the very nice presentations. These are two fantastic examples of uh, basic uh, science. In this case, uh, these are biologics uh, and basic science, which we're very excited about in terms of translating them into uh, new me uh, medicines. Um, one other thing that hasn't been mentioned so much, but we do have, uh, people talked about collaborations and uh, because we're on uh, Torrey Pines Mesa, which as uh, Dr. D'Angelo mentioned, is a real hub for biotech and, and so on, uh, and learning in, in Southern California. Uh, we have very close associations with uh, clinicians at U, uh, UC San Diego, at, at Scripps, Research, uh, at the, um, Scripps Clinic and so on. And this enables us, this means we have uh, the ability to talk firsthand to people who are on the front lines treating patients. So um, with that, I am going to uh, hand over to our first presenter, who is uh, Li Zhang, uh, uh, sorry, Yu Zhuan Zhang uh, in the Comiso uh, lab. And Yu Zhuan is going to talk about an area of great interest to us, uh, deadly pancreatic cancer. So Yijuan, please go ahead. Hello everyone, I'm Yijuan. Uh, I'm currently a, post, a T32 postdoc fellow in Camiso lab at San Bernan Preps. Um, I'm originally from China and I did my first postdoc training at the University of Cincinnati in Ohio State. And I studied the PNA nanoparticles for breast cancer therapy. Then I moved to San Diego in 2017 to join my family here. And we found San Diego is a really very comfortable place to live in. Uh, I joined the Comiso lab because I'm very interested in the macrophenostosis related cell metabolism. And I became a, uh, became a she said to a postdoc fellow last year. And besides of the funding uh, support, I got lots of training uh, workshops uh, hosted by our OT's office, uh, including the, the Tory Pine leadership, uh, pro de uh, leadership development program, and also other uh, different workshops, helping with the manuscript and grant writing, and, and also the presentation, and they're very helpful for my research and also for my science communications. So today I'm very glad to be here to share my uh, research experience with you. Uh, my talk is about the macrophenostosis at the nexus of crosstalk in the pancreatic tumor microenvironment. As you know, pancreatic cancer is one of the most malignant cancer in the world. And, and, and it's the certain, sorry, it's the certain lethal cancer uh, in, in US, the United States in 2020, and the related five year survival rate is only 80%. So the uh, amount of the pancreatic cancer, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma known as PDOC, accounts for 90% of the uh, pancreatic cancer. So there are key hallmarks of PDOC. One of it is the 90% of the PDOC are KRAS mutant, and the KRAS is the uh, driven gene to promote tumor growth. And in the stroma part, 
of the abundant cell uh, called the cancer associated fibroblasts, also known as GAFs, uh, cause the notorious death of pleasure. So uh, through depositing the collagen and other extracellular matrix proteins in the stroma to cause the um, desmoplasia, which it has been related to the hypovascularity and the hypoxia, and which has been also related to another key hallmark of the PDAC stroma is the strongly immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. So what's macrophenocytosis? It is a kind of endocytosis pathway mediated the non-selective uptake of extracellular fluid, uh, fluid. And along with it, the abundant proteins like albumin and the cell debris will be uptake to the cells and delivered to the lysome for degradation to generate amino acids and the lipids to support the cell metabolism. So macrophenocytosis has been identified as an important amino acid supply route in the KRAS mutated PDAC tumors and using the selective inhibitors, or EIPA, it's dramatically shrink the tumor uh, growth of human PDAC. So since I joined Camiso lab, I'm very interested in uh, whether the stroma cells also utilize macrophenocytosis as an important nutrient scavenge pathway to support the tumor growth. Uh, due to the interest of time, so I will briefly uh, introduce the major discoveries about this work. So using the patient-derived calves, we found the glutamine deprivation will elevate the extracellular cytosol uh, calcium levels, which lead to the activation of KMPK2 and AMPK up pathway. It also upregulates the RGF2 uh, expression, and these two pathways lead to the activation of RAC1 to induce macrophenocytosis. And the macrophenocytosis of albumin could uh, generate the amino acids and support the survival of the calves. And the calves will also secrete some of the non-essential amino acids to the outside, which could be utilized by the uh, PDAC cells to support their survival. Using a xenograft tumor model through co-injection of the ASPC1 cells, and also the, uh, and the wild-type calves or the macrophenocytosis incompetent calves, we found the calves could support the PDAC tumor growth through macrophenocytosis. So this work was recently published and our lab also obtained an R1 grant based on this work. So here I want to highlight that um, our core facility really contributed a lot to our project. Uh, like the cancer metabolism core, they help us to quantify the amino acid levels in both the cells and the cell conditioned meter. And uh, the proteomics core help us to identify the RGF2 upregulation by the glutamine deprivation, which is essential for the infection of macrophenocytosis. And uh, there's lots of mouse works involved with supported by our animal facility and also the histological help to do the pa paraffin and the frozen sections, which is important to the, for the completion of this work. So we also found that the EIPA treatment will decrease the collagen deposition in the stroma of PDAC. Through staining of the CD31, we found EIPA treatment will increase the vascular density. So that's led to a question whether EIPA will change the immune landscape in the uh, PDAC tumors. That will be important for the immunotherapy. So we collaborated with the expert in the immunological field, Dr. Linda Bradley uh, and her lab our lab helped us to establish the protocol to do the immunoprofiling within the PDAC tumors. And we found EIPA treatment specifically upregulate the tumor infiltration of CD4 and the CD8 T cells, which are verified by HC stainings. And at the meantime, the EIPA treatment decreased the tumor growth. So uh, also the outfly um, cytometry core and histological help a lot with this part of the work. So since EIPA could increase the uh, tumor infiltration of those T cells, so we are wondering whether the combination of EIPA and with those uh, immunologic point inhibitors could turn the cold tumor uh, to a hot tumor to activate the immune response inside the tumor and further suppress tumor growth. So this is the ongoing project in our lab right now. And finally, I want to thank my mentor, Dr. Cosimo Camiso, uh, for his great help and uh, support for both my research and the career development, and also my lab, lab members for their kind uh, collaboration and help with this project. I want to thank our uh, collaborator, Dr. Linda Bradley and her lab. 
uh, they help to lead the lead us to the immunological field and always ready to provide the technical spot. Also, as I said, I want to thank our core facility for their contribution uh, in our project. They really help to move our project uh, forward. And also, I want to thank our Otis office. Uh, as, as you already know from the previous presentations, they uh, organize a lot, lot of different workshops and especially the Tory Pine Leadership Development Program, which are really helpful for my research and the career development. And uh, this work was supported by our grant and also the TCD2 uh, postdoc fellowship. Uh, that's all. Um, thank you everyone for your attention. And if you are interested in our work or have any question about the fellowship and the position application, we can talk later in the break rooms. See you later, thank you. Thank you, Yishuan, very nice presentation. And then uh, last but not least, uh, Corey Bretz. Uh, and the title of his talk is To Transpose or Not to Transpose. And Corey is in Dr. Peter Allen's lab. Thank you, uh, Nick. I will share my screen now. Okay, so uh, yes, hi, my name is Corey Bretz. I did my postdoctoral training uh, and Dr. Peter Adams' lab. So I'd like to, to give my gratitude to him and his uh, the opportunity to do some postdoctoral training uh, at Sanford Burnham Previs in his lab. So uh, much of today, I will probably uh, repeat a lot of what uh, my colleagues and other professors have said about Sanford Burnham Previs and the training opportunities there and how the core facilities and shared resources are really instrumental to postdoctoral training at the Institute, uh, not to mention all the collaborations that the Institute has with neighboring institutes and uh, pharma companies or other biotechs. And so today, um, my, my talk might be a little bit different uh, than the other trainees in that um, some of my research focused on uh, whether or not um, epigenetics was allowing transposition of retro elements. And, um, and then, I, you know, so in a similar approach, um, SVP was instrumental in, I guess, my transposition uh, it, for my career into the uh, industry setting. So uh, I'll, I'll give a little bit of um, talk about that and how the T32 was, um, a specific component of it was really instrumental in that uh, process. So to, to give a brief um, background about the research that happens in Peter Adams' lab, uh, his, his lab really focuses on how epigenetics of aging contributes to disease, whether that be cancer or other age-related diseases uh, with um, immunothe uh, immun immunology or anything like that. So one big factor of aging is that we accumulate uh, cells called senescent cells. And this is um, a, a, a process that occurs when a healthy cell undergoes stress by either activated oncogenes or uh, significant DNA damage or mitochondrial dysfunctions. And so senescent cells uh, basically arrest the cell cycle, and they reinforce this by a chemokine release called the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. Now, what we noticed in these cells was that a particular histone mark called H4K20 trimethylation increases across all models of senescence, whether that be, whether that be called um, replicative senescence, it's when cells undergo too many cell divisions and then accumulate damages to the DNA or other mechanisms and uh, become arrested or oncogene induced senescence and other types of radiation. So simultaneously, what we also noticed was that uh, retrotransposable elements are also drastically increased over their proliferating counterparts. And so we had hypotheses that then uh, H4K20 trimethylation was a barrier to transposition and thus blocks cancer. Uh, so the hypothesis is then that without H4K or with H4K20 trimethylation, when a cell goes senescent, um, it prevents these jumping genes from moving around the genome, and uh, that causes a stable genomic uh, integrity. So that would then block then um, an arrested senescent cell from escaping and becoming cancer. Whereas uh, without H4K20 trimethylation, you can then have transposable elements moving throughout your genome, causing genomic instability, which then would cause uh, escape from senescence and uh, allow you have then damaged cells 
allowed to proliferate again and can uh, generate cancer. So an approach that we took was to identify then readers of H4K20 in uh, arrested senescent cells. Uh, and then also um, what would then be erasers of this mark and that would promote uh, cancer formation. So I won't go into much as uh, of the data as I, my other colleagues have gone through. Um, so, but I'll, I'll go through the models that we used and how the cores uh, at SBP and the shared resources really facilitated the research. So first was our animal model. And so um, we had then um, the classic Crelox P system um, where we knocked out the gene uh, histone methyltransferase 5C, uh, which deposits the H4K20 trimethylation mark. So the animal facility was really instrumental in establishing the mouse model. So we uh, performed in vitro fertilizations with them. They were um, instrumental in our breeding and our husbandry. So there's many staff uh, that help us with that. And it really relieves a lot of the, the routine work that a postdoc would need to be doing, um, such as genotyping and all these other you know, um, animal husbandry duties so that you can really focus in on and develop your experiments and um, acquire the, the critical data. And then they also help you with um, any sort of, um, let's say, um, like for in my case, I had these hydrodynamic injections, which is a, a you know a very critical um, or technical way to do a tailbane injection. And, uh, and so Buddy Charbono over there was really helpful in in helping me do these hydrodynamic injections. So all in all, is th this support I think is is really instrumental. And in, um, so I'd really give a shout out to everyone. In the animal facility, Mary and Alan Sadnershako for organizing that facility. Um, so we took a couple approaches, uh, both in vivo and in vitro. So at our in vivo approach, like I was saying, was um, we were do these hydrodynamic injections of a system called the Sleeping Beauty system. And what it says is it introduces a transposon and then also a transposase. And if you inject this plasmids uh, fast enough, into the tail vein, uh, it rushes over the liver cells such that these plasmids are then able to get inside. Once they're inside, uh, then this transposon is integrated into the genome, to the mouse genome. And so you have an excision product, uh, which then leaves a footprint such that we can then sequence that and see how many insertions we have per genome. And then we can also sequence uh, the mouse genome to see where that transposon um, landed. Now the transposon itself also had a, a, a fluorescent mar or a, um, a marker in there such that we could visualize it by um, live animal imaging. So then we could track then um, uh, where the cells were inserted in the liver, like how many insertions there were. And then also uh, this particular transposon housed an oncogene. So we were trying to drive cancer in the knockout uh, background. And so um, we were able to use the animal imaging and analysis core to really go ahead and track those live tumors forming. So like I was saying, um, we can also then do histology in the, li uh, in the liver against the RAS mutant, such that we can see where, uh, you know, how many cells were, trans where we had the transposition. And then we can also track uh, and look at those tumors that were growing in the, lumer, in the liver uh, with histopathology. So this model also utilized the genomics core where uh, we then sequenced um, the genome to see where those insertions were happening and, we, and to get our number of insertions per genome. Our in vitro model, uh, so what we did was, uh, this was in, instrumental in identifying readers of the H4K20 trimethylation mark. So what we did was uh, isolate primary cells and then uh, for our wild type and knockout, and then we would in, induce uh, senescence with a variety of um, ways. Um, and so uh, you can find out more by uh, talking with Peter Adams about how they do all the senescence induction in his lab. Um, and then what we would do is isolate then the nuclei of these senescent cells and incubate them uh, with a peptide of um, that's modified or not modified with the trimethyl mark. And so we would then fish out any prey that would then bind that bait um, and then we can um, go ahead and uh, elute uh, off the beads, and then we can um, do some mass spec and with the proteomics core to identify any prey that was then binding our bait. 
episode, we were able to identify readers that way. Um, and then on the other approach with the in vitro way uh, was to identify the erasers. And so again, we did the primary cell isolation and using our knockout uh, cells as a control. Um, then we then had a, an arrayed screen for the siRNA library such that we could read then H4K20 trimethylation immunofluorescence. And we use the functional genomics core here to set up this siRNA arrayed screen. So I'll go a little bit more into the actual T32 and how um, what really stood out for me, the program elements that really stood out for me and helped me. And then, um, and then I'll go into a little bit about how uh, this internship uh, led to my position now uh, in industry and the further um, advancement of my career. So the, the program elements that, that were really helpful for me was, of course, the curriculum of education and training activities that Nisha and Diane uh, presented earlier. Um, so these were very, I think all the postdocs can agree that these are very, um, these are very helpful for everyone. And um, th they give you another way of advancing your, I guess, these soft skills or these transferable skills such that, um, you know, it's a, it's a non-research based focused a lot of times, but then they also can help you a lot with your grant writing and that sort of thing. So also the, the research side of it too. Um, the Cancer Center has a, an excellent seminar series. I can't, and then also other centers too. So all the centers have their own seminar series. And really the seminars that come through SVP are, are top notch. I mean, we have, I mean, we have Nobel laureates come to speak for us. So um, it's really nice. And then the postdocs and grad students can sit down and have lunch with them after. And I mean, so you're having lunch with a, with a Nobel laureate. I mean, come on, who wouldn't want to do that? So uh, that was awesome. Um, we have, so SVP puts on a in-house annual training symposium, and this is uh, during the postdoc appreciation week. And um, so grad students and postdocs can then present their posters or uh, oral presentations. And then we also had that T32 retreat where you can also practice presenting your research. You get an AAR, AACR membership, an annual meeting, which is very nice because this is an international meeting. Um, and then you also have funds for other conferences to apply or uh, supplies or other equipment that you might need uh, to conduct your research. Now, something very, very interesting about the T30, the Cancer Center T32 is that there's an internship component. Now you can choose to do this um, at SVP and say the screening core or the screening facility. Um, I chose to do mine at uh, down the street at a startup incubator called J Labs. And this is hosted by Janssen, who is owned by Johnson & Johnson. I know it's kind of the, trickle down. But um, so this is an incubator space for uh, biotech companies that are starting up and uh, they can rent bench space and uh, have common equipments to use to develop their company idea. And so I'll go into a little bit more about that uh, shortly. And so this was a picture of our, our initial T32 and immunology T32 cohort. And it was nice to work with, with everyone and many of who spoke today. So the courses that the Otis put on for us are top notch. And these are the ones that really stood out uh, to me and that I participated in. So the grant writing and manuscript writing courses are wonderful. I highly recommend uh, that. And then the HUD freeze uh, science communication course, um, that was awesome too. It really puts you, well, for me, at least it put me in a situation where I was, uh, I had to get comfortable. So I'm not so used to, um, you know, promoting myself in that sort of way. So it learned, I learned a lot of ways to communicate science in which I was never used to. Um, so really it makes your presentation skills much, much better. Uh, there was so many mother, so many other career expl uh, exploration and preparation type uh, activities that we could do. So we had, um, you know, these coffee talks where we would have um, guests come in from other biotechs or um, law firms where they're doing um, IP law or just, I mean, other so many other career explanation um, ways to just see what else is out there uh, besides the academic track. And then, um, of course, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the responsibility in conduct and research. These are two courses that I didn't think I would enjoy, but I really ended up enjoying them because it made me really uh, critically think about 
how I was treating people and then how I was actually conducting my research and making sure that, you know, everything that I was doing um, was, you know, the, the right way. And so I really think that those are, I, I think it should just be mandatory for everyone, <laughs> which I think the diversity is. So, um, and then of course, like everyone else pointed out, the Tory Lines Leadership Development Program, uh, this was a, a very much standout uh, course for me. Um, and then as you can see, this was our cohort and you just get to interact with so many people that you might not usually interact with and you make a lot of new friends and um, potential collaborations. And then, so yeah, I really recommend it. I, I mean, sometimes you have to really think about yourself and um, and you're kind of presented with situations that, you know, you might um, be, you know, it's not your comfort zone, but it, it really helps you think about how you can uh, help others, um, you know, blossom under in a team. So uh, it's, it's, it's top notch. So I'll tell you a little bit about the internship program that I did. So I joined this company 1859 at, at the time we were at J labs and uh, we we're about 15 members. We've then grown to uh, over 40 now. And so what, what do we do here? So this is our team. And, and just like the community at SVP and the teams there, uh, we're so close knit and you, you really felt like everyone was helping each other. Um, I didn't want to go to a place next where it, it didn't feel that way. And so when I did my internship at 1859, the, the team that the camaraderie there was just so good that I didn't want to leave. So um, what are we doing? So basically we're, we're the future of screening. Okay. We're highly paralyzing it and making it super efficient with our Darwin platform. And um, we're taking down the screen time to two hours. We're making our footprint uh, on the bench top and we're using a thousand X less material and dramatically lowering the cost. So how are we able to do this? Um, just like 10X genomics turned to microfluidics, that's what we're doing. So we're doing a Pico high throughput screening platform in which then we um, have an assay material um, it with houses your target and your assay buffers um, and whatever else you need for your assay. And then we have a library of the compounds that are encoded by DNA such that they have a barcode. And so, um, and then you have your probes so you can, and your other assay buffers such that you can track and usually you feed in ATP to start the reaction uh, through this channel. And so then each droplet then houses a single bead and compound which then um, gets uh, combined with your assay. And then we can release this by um, a variety of ways, most commonly UV. And so now your compound is uh, in solution with your target and incubating. Um, and then if it then inhibits or activates your assay, we can then sort that uh, and then collect the hit. And then after that, we amplify the, in by the indexes and then we uh, do some next gen sequencing uh, to decode the library and know which hits and so we then um, can have a, a, a very robust data set where we are having um, replicates of um, at least 10x and our hit rate of about 0.1%, um, which, is, which is very nice. So um, with this system, we are able to, to look at 160,000 molecules per target per week. And so really we're thinking, the moon and beyond. And so I, I made this slide in parallel uh, to where just how our PICO system, our Darwin system is taking us to the moon. The, the resources, the shared resources, um, the, the core facilities, the, the collaborations within the, within the Institute and among the neighboring institutes, uh, Sanford Bird and Privates is really a place where your, your research, there, there is no limit, okay? There's nothing holding you back from doing whatever you wanna do there. And that's just really the, the, the one thing I remember about Sanford Bird and Privates was that I did not feel limited in any way. And so whatever you wanna do, you can do it. So thank you very much and I uh, hope you enjoyed. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Corey. And thank you everybody who uh, presented. This is, uh, I'm James Short. I'm on the communications team and I'm just uh, 
glad to be a witness to this. And we're gonna quickly go into a um, couple questions before we go into the special part of the program, the breakout rooms where you'll get to um, talk to everybody um, you heard from today directly. So, but re really question uh, quickly, Linda, I'd like to bring you back up. We got a couple questions about, um, about how many trainees you accept into the T32 program each year and what are the requirements for an applicant? Yes, well, thank you very much. Uh, the T32 Immunology Postdoctoral Fellowship has three postdoc slots. So when the three slots are filled, they're not, there's not any available slots. And people, as you probably um, heard from a couple of trainees who are like John Grist and uh, Jennifer Hope from my lab, they have rotated off. So the maximum time allowed on the T32 is three years. And the applicant, right now we have openings, we have three openings. So um, it's a good time. And this is an opportunity for all of you to consider us uh, with the various mentors. Uh, the requirements, of course, first and foremost, are you, you must be an American citizen or a green card holder. That's a, because this is a federally funded uh, opportunity. Uh, that's one of the requirements from the NIH. The other requirements are to fill out the application to describe your research interests and your background. And of course, we require letters of recommendation from your previous mentors. The, we have a steering committee who evaluates the applications and prioritizes candidates and also circulates the um, applications, of course, based on if you as an applicant have identified a, men a potential mentor or mentors, we uh, uh, direct your application specifically to them. Once your application has been received and you're being considered by these other metrics, then you are invited to do a um, fairly informal presentation of your research, describing your past research and then your research goals. And from then on, from there on, the committee decides um, about, and of course you have to be accepted by a pre preceptor uh, and the co steering committee and other committee members uh, discuss the applicant and the suitability for the T32 program. Perfect. And then um, for Max, um, what about uh, non-citizen um, applicants? Uh, are there other opportunities at the Institute that they can uh, explore? Yeah. So, so yeah, if you're not, uh, not a citizen, you cannot be part of a T32 because that's a regulation from, from NIH, basically. But that shouldn't prevent you from, from applying to the last year. So, so we are, many of us are looking for postdocs. So, so you don't have to be part of the T32 to train at, at Stanford Burnham. That's just one additional resource that we have. So what I suggest is you, you contact the labs that you're interested in and, and inquire if they have openings. Many openings are already in our webpage. So you can go to our webpage and they avail the open jobs and you will find many, many labs that already uh, have uh, positions open, but there are many other labs that might be looking for postdocs that haven't put the position out yet. So I will suggest uh, everyone that is interested in, in training in, with us, just contact the labs that you're interested in and, and directly and, and yeah, ask them about uh, the opportunities to, to train. So, yeah. 